Okay, guys. The dogs have been fed, supper's been had, and the girls are in the bed. It's time to do this voiceover of the class. Volume 6, Terminal Tackle In-Depth, and some knots you need to know. This is going to be a more in-depth class about the little stuff that makes it all work, that we're all particular about, and I hope I can teach you something new or give you one of them aha moments about some tackle you already use. So let's get started. When you break down terminal tackle, either when you're shopping online or when you're going to a store or you're thinking about, you know, what you need to pack, your terminal tackle or your nuts and bolts of your rigging, um, obviously number one is going to be your hooks, followed very closely by your weights. And coming up real close now with the invention of the shaky head and especially the Ned rig, you know, jig heads have come on as being you know, a real, real key item to have a lot of different styles and variations and options of. So they're right there too. And then there's some other stuff that's important you need to have as well for certain applications. We're going to go through all of them. It's going to be a good class. Let's get going. We're going to start with hooks. Tons of different styles, tons of different applications, lots of different reasons to have a lot of these different hooks. We're going to start off with worm hooks, and this is probably the number one thing everybody looks at when you think about a fish hook or a fishing hook as far as bass fishing. Um, you know, there's tons of other hooks for saltwater, catfish, um, you know, minnow fishing, you know, things like that. But when you think about bass fishing, these are the three hooks that come to mind, at least for me. And that's your worm hooks, your straight shank hook there on the left your offset shank hook there in the middle, and then your extra wide gap hook on the right, which has become exceedingly more popular in the last 10 to 20 years. Covering the straight shank first though, the key with the straight shank, as it always has been, is you get your maximized strength and hook set power. There is no angle that the shank of the hook takes from the eye of the hook down to the gap what we call the gap, the space between the point and the shank. There's no angle there where the metal has had to flex or bend or twist or make a different shape to lose any of its rigidity. So you get meat, muscle, and power with this hook. It's very universal to a degree. It can do just about almost anything, and that's you know proven in the fact that Years ago, when my daddy was fishing, they didn't have a lot of these other types of hooks. They had a straight shank hook. Most of them have little barbs at the top of it to hold the plastic on, little small briar pricks at the top, and you put everything on there, and you just made your hook bigger or smaller based on what you were fishing. So it was very basic, but it gets the job done. Is it perfect? Absolutely not for everything, and we're going to talk about that. There are a ton of different sizes. This thing usually goes from anywhere about mm, a number two all the way up to a you know five six all big giant flipping hook. Um, I don't know that they go that big, but I feel like they do down there in Florida and Texas. They're very readily available. Every company makes them. Uh, you can get them at Walmart, or you can get them off Tackle Warehouse that cost twelve dollars a pack for six if you buy trocar hooks and um, you know, you can find them just about anywhere you go, at least the straight shank hooks you can. But they're not the best for Texpo's rigging for everyday plastics. And we're going to go over that in depth here further in the class. But to show you kind of what I'm talking about, this rig right here, or these rigs, it's the same rig, it's a punch rig, was built for heavy vegetation with an old tungsten weight on top of it, big barrel weight to punch through veg and get to those fish deep under mats and deep within vegetation. And the hook set is strong, which is why you don't want any flex in your hook, which is why most of the fellas that are flipping down there in that heavy you know, vegetation are fooling with these straight shank flipping hooks now. There's a bunch of different sizes and styles. If you look on Tackle Warehouse, there's tons of them set up just for flipping and punching. And they're going to be straight shank, short, strong, mean hooks. The key you got to watch, though, is see the angle of the hook there in the rig. 
to get that bait to be completely weedless on that hook, you've got to angle that thing way out. And that causes that hook point direction to be at that 11 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock angle on the face of the clock. So if you have that hook point sticking out at all, and you flip into something with some kind of, you know, texture to it, you're going to hang up on it real quick. But if you keep that hook buried in there, you won't have that problem. The issue is you got this big old giant hook gap sticking out of the bait, which may or may not matter to the angler about looking natural. But if you're going to punch and flip with straight shank hooks, this is the type of angle you're going to have to have going through your bait. So that's where the gap comes into play. You need to make sure that the gap of the hook you're flipping with is of such that it'll go on through the plastic when you hit it hard and go on into the fish's mouth with plenty of room to anchor in and bite the fish back to the boat or as it is down there you just winch them in and drag them through the grass so watch the hook gap distance between the hook and the bait critical important with any of your hooks guys just keep an eye make sure you've got enough gap to do the job and i'm probably going to be saying that a lot more going on if you wanted to do a text pose, and that's what this is, where you have the hook point exposed and it's weightless, not weightless, Texas rig, whatever, you got to be careful about the angle and killing the gap and making sure it's not going to get hung up with every little sprig of grass or every little leaf or whatever you come through. So this is why with baits that are a little bit more narrow that you're going to be working through cover with that hook angle like that with the hook point coming at that angle you just got to be ready it'll work i mean this is what guys used to do all the time when they first started fishing a floating worm and a fluke for that matter um but you got to be mindful that that hook is not going to lay down flat on that bait's back like we're used to with the other hooks now you know it's it's going to be pointed up which can be good you know if the fish takes it and you lean into him odds are it's going straight in the roof of his mouth you ain't got to worry about it but pros and cons if you set the hook pulling through a dock too fast pulling through a tree limb too fast it's going to bury plus it's got this giant old gap hanging down at that kind of crazy angle but like i said that may not matter just make sure you get the right hook to do what you want moving to the offset shank so this is where you add a little bit of kink in your hook point there and you're in your hook shape it's still got good strength Especially the ones that are, you know, made with a super line kind of metal. Like Gamagatsu has some super line ones that are really strong. And Trocars are really strong. It's good hook strength and good hook set power. Not as strong, obviously, as a straight shank. But it's still there. you still got a pretty good lineup with your eye. Not a whole lot of flex in the wire of the hook. This is a whole lot better, though, for smaller weedless presentations. Most of the time, you can get these hooks... From a size number two to a number four, I don't think I've ever seen a number four. Maybe a number two is the smallest I've seen. All the way up to a big old seven alt for those great big old monster worms, 12-inch worms you want to fish offshore. These are readily available as well. They can be affordable or they can be expensive depending on what company you use. But if you want to use some Gamagatsus or some, you know, little owners, they're not too bad. They're not that expensive. It's not a very specialized hook. They're not the best for heavy-duty flick, uh, flipping you know, thicker baits, and I'll show you why. So when you rig this hook on these thinner soft plastics for a Texas rig, for a Texpose weightless rig, whatever, this is the lineup you're going to use. And you can see right now why it works so well on these thinner baits. The eye of the hook is straight up and down in line with the plastic. The point comes straight up back on the back of the bait and there's enough gap there to make it all work with a finesse worm on the left with a baby brush hog in the middle and even with old mag 2 on the right there by zoom big giant offshore worm the gap works so this is why you can see how this particular hook would be better for this application than maybe a straight shank hook it's cleaner it's going to come through more weedless. You still have your power. The hook just fits the bait appropriately where all your power is straight in line with the eye of the hook and the point of the hook. So this is why I think this hook started being designed probably to fish worms, if I had to guess. 
if you're going to look at it with a weedless, weightless rig, that's a white trick worm on top, a Zoom Super Fluke on the bottom, it works there too, especially with that trick worm. You see how clean that all works. You know, gauge the size of that hook based on the worm. If you want it to fall slower, try to get a lighter wire offset shank hook. Just the opposite if you want it to fall slower. You can keep that same hook size and try to find a company that makes that size in a super line or a heavy duty gauged wire hook. Or you could go a little bit bigger, but be careful when you go a little bit bigger with your floating weedless, weightless finesse stuff because the more hook you have back into that bait, the more action you take out of it. So keep that in mind. I usually like about a three aught, maybe a four aught in my trick worm fishing. The hook down at the bottom on the super fluke, we all know about the uh, hook slot in the middle. So it doesn't look like you have much gap there, but you really do. Uh, the slot in the in the belly of that flute goes up to almost where you see the, the silver sparkles meet that laminate. And um, that's going to give you a good, good gap there. You see the hook laying right on the back of the fluke like it's supposed to. Uh, the hook's laying right in the middle of the nose. Works just fine. I have used both of this style hook and an EWG with a fluke. And both will work. Speaking of the EWG, extra wide gap. It's got good strength and good hook set power based on the wire thickness that you get. There is a lot of flex and a lot of distance that that wire has to travel now once it hits the eye to get back to the point laterally. It's really, really good for wider presentations that need to be weedless, big bulky baits. Pretty sure it was designed to flip tubes. Not positive. I'm pretty sure that's where it all came about. Again, the sizes are very similar. I have not seen, yeah, I may have seen a number two. The smallest I think I've ever fished is about a number one or a one aught. And I have seen some great old big, I believe this comes in like a 10 aught. Believe it or not, I know I've seen a 7. I think they make some great old big 10 aughts for big swim baits and things like that. It is readily available and as affordable as you make it. Again, you can spend some money on these. Trocars are very expensive. They're extremely sharp and strong. Or you can buy some old Bass Pro Shops brand, get them for $4 package. Still going to be a little weaker, but it'll get the job done. This particular hook is not as good for real skinny straight baits because of the absolute gaudiness and stick outiness you're going to get when you put a pencil thin bait on this hook. It's just not necessary. Now it's it could work. It's fine, but it's not necessary. This is what that hook was built for. Um, this is a Texas rig with an EWG. On the left you have a Zoom Ultra Vibe Speed Crawl. That's a Zoom Z Hog in the second rung. That is a um, flipping tube on the third. And then that's actually a, I think a six inch Cinco on the far right side, which that works fine with that because the Cinco is very thick and it's very heavily salted. So you want it to move on out of the way as quick as possible. And so I usually use a little bit beefier hook when I'm fooling with the Cinco. But this allows you to use that thicker bait, the crawl bait, the creature style baits, stuff like the beavers, um, and obviously the tubes, and get by with keeping enough gap to make sure the hook goes up in the fish's mouth and on through the plastic. Um, but just kind of looking at why they all line up right is, is kind of critical to what size, which style of hook, whether or not you want it to be a heavy super line gauge hook or a thinner hook depending on the fish you're fishing how you want the bait to move around ewgs are helped have helped you fish those thicker baits and here it is shown fishing on one of my favorite things to fish which is the fluke style baits it does work fine to me it's overkill for the super fluke and the super fluke junior there at the top but it works great it will help keep them keeled i will give you that that little bit more wire hanging down will help keep him belly down 
whereas otherwise he might barrel roll a little bit more with a, a narrower hook. Um, but you know, you have that, that belly slit in the middle on those two flukes on top, so it may or may not be a necessity, but you might like it. And if you do, keep fishing it. That's a sluggo at the bottom. It has a solid body, so that one is almost a necessity for that. That gives you the more gap to let that sluggo get out of the way when you hit a fish and penetrate his mouth like you're supposed to. When using these new swim baits we're all using now, that's a skinny dipper on the top left by Reaction Innovations. One of the first solid body boot paddle tail swim baits that really took over the market. Um, the EWG works great for them as well. If you're going to fish them weightless, if you're going to put a bullet weight in front of them, heck, if you're going to Carolina rig them. Uh, I've seen that before too. Probably want to stick with an EWG as well. There in the bottom white box, you're looking at the most famous swim bait in the country right now. And that's a Keytech Swing Impact Fat. Um, they're titled that because at the you know front part of the body, it's right much fatter. As it pairs down to the tail, it gets thinner. But EWG hook, almost a necessity for that. If you're not going to put them on a jig head or a buzz bait or spinner bait or something like that, and you want to just fish them on a hook somehow, basically you have to use an EWG. On the right, two little things hardly nobody thinks about anymore. Uh, the one at the bottom's, you know, pretty basic. It's just a Fat Albert grub. Uh, they're about three and a half, four inches long out of the package. And if you're going to swim them weedless, weightless, or even flip them on a Texas rig, um, EWG hook is going to be the way to go. The thing at the top there that might look kind of weird to you, that's a little trick I do. I take an Ultra Vibe Speed Worm from Zoom and I cut the thing way down and I turn the tail up. I don't know why you have to turn the tail up versus down, but go ahead and turn it up because if you turn it down, it's not going to work right. <laughs> so um, turn the tail up and throw it weightless. And it's a fun little wake baiting grub that I've had a blast with in the past few years in springtime. So I wish Zoom would read this or hear this conversation and start taking uh, taking a lead on making a Ultra Vibe Speed grub. That would be phenomenal. Then I wouldn't have to cut all my Ultra Vibe Speed worms down and waste plastic. But anywho, grubs and swim baits, throw a EWG. So to summarize... The three worm hooks. Straight shank is going to be the least amount of flex, the strongest on your hook set, the largest gap between the eye and the point, and great for your hardest hook sets, for your, I mean, you're jacking their jaw sideways in Florida and Texas, flipping heavy stuff. The gap between the eye and the point is going to cause that over-exaggerated angle if you're going to fish weedless. So that would be, if anything, the only negative. Also, it doesn't really hold the head of the worm or the bait up very well. It has a tendency to try to slide down pretty quick. Drop of super glue will help that, but they've got some now with really cool bait keeper tubes and stuff on them. But yeah, the old school straight shake hooks, man... The head of that worm loved to slide down. So the offset shank worm hook really helped with that part. It does have some flex. It's pretty strong. Good straight hook set straight up from the eye to the point. There's not a whole lot of gap though between the eye and the point. And that's why I say for real fat baits it's not going to work very well. It's not going to behave like you want it to. But it is phenomenal for tech exposing those thinner normal sized worms and lizards and such. And then you go to the OEFG, and it's it's got a lot more flex to it, unless you get a super line, which are thicker, more expensive. And they're very, very strong on an offset hook set. So if, if, if you feel like you're missing fish because it is flexing, you can either step up to a stronger EWG hook, or you can try a straight shank. But more often than not, it's going to be another reason you're missing fish. Because this point's pointed straight back up to the you know, to the back of the bait, and you still get all your power you need to hammer it home. It's really good for your wider baits. It's almost essential for most of the wider baits, unless you can figure out some crazy stuff to do with that straight shank. But 
for wider baits. That's why it was developed an extra wide gap to hold those bigger baits straight and get a better hook set on them. So weed guard hooks, these used to not even ever be popular and I had dabbled with them a little bit and now they're coming back and the reason they're coming back is the Nico rig. And we're going to talk about that in a second. They're typically a straight shank or an octopus style hook. Very simple hook. More often than not, most of the emphasis is put on the weed guard itself, whether it's wire, heavy monofilament, fiber, whatever. Most of the emphasis is put on how the thing is weedless and then the size of it. So this is typically used for a weightless, slow sink type of bait or with the new Nico rig. Super popular with that. Everybody's got their own style of it now. Used to be real popular with just Senkos, just letting it fall on the, you know, the naked hook with no weight added. Like I said, there's multiple weed guard types, and most of your sizes are going to be limited to that number two up to about a two aught, maybe even a three aught at most. And this is what they're doing with them. So what we're doing with them is a couple different things. The Nico rig there on the left is obviously the most popular. You take your favorite finesse bait. It could be a crawl. It could be a lizard. Most of the time, it's a straight shank worm of some sort. You're going to put some type of weight. Some guys were using just screws to start with right in the nose of the bait. Just screw it up in there to give it a nose down weight profile. And then thread the hook right through the meat of the worm down there near his kind of shoulders, kind of upper torso area. And that creates a sick little feeding action on the bottom with an open hook. So you can fish it on a real light line, get real long sweeping hook sets and catch some pressured fish. It works. I've caught fish on it. And these weedless hooks will really help it go moving forward. Something to try. Think of it like fishing a drop shot versus like a shaky head. It's kind of a combination between the two. I think that's the best analogy I've ever made for it. So yeah, think of it like that. A drop shot versus a shaky head as far as rod, reel, and technique. That's what I would say for the Nico rig. Finding the right hook is up to you. There's a thousand different opinions on that. Smaller, bigger, weed guard, no weed guard, whatever. Just try some and see if you like them. Cool little technique though. I expect it to keep staying pretty popular. The one at the, bot, at the uh, top right is one that I developed. I'm sure somebody else has developed it, but it's one that I put together for myself to show bedding bass something different. Instead of flipping a crawl or flipping a worm, I went and got me some magnum flukes. And I ain't seen nobody around here in Charlotte, North Carolina fish a magnum fluke. Most of it's a super fluke junior or a super fluke. I found some magnum flukes. I said, good grief, I'm going to try that. Because we're fishing for the biggest fish in the lake, guys, when we're bed fishing. We're not fishing for pound and a half fish no more. We're fishing for the slaunches. So I said, ain't nobody throwing that thing. I'm going to throw some. But I didn't have hooks big enough to do it. So I went over and tried to find a hook that fit it as far as an EWG goes. And they were so big that I was worried I'd have to throw it on like a flipping stick. So I got the idea from some stuff I already did to just nose rig it with a weed guarded hook out the front of it. And it worked. It took the flute nose down. It stayed, for the most part, pretty snag free. And it let me flip that bait because all the weight of the fluke is back penduluming that hook real well. That whole fluke, you can flip that thing on a medium heavy rod with no weight. It's that heavy. And it worked real well. I caught some nice fish on it. I hadn't fooled with it lately. I probably ought to pull it back out and just see if it still works. But that was an interesting way of fishing a weedless hook. A weed guard hook. And then, like I said, the old Senko with the O-ring. Sticking it through there, just letting it wacky rig and fall on its own way. Probably the most popular way of fishing with that bait and with that particular type of hook until the Nico rig really takes off. But that's what it was designed for early on in its career with that weed guard hook was to help you fish a wacky rig better. So going to octopus and mosquito hooks, these are little guys that most people think about with drop shottings. They're smaller, needle sharp little hook with a round bend. Typically they don't have any barbs on them or any offsets or anything like that. <coughs> Excuse me. They're extremely popular for your drop shotting. Some guys are using them for wacky rigging and nose hooking. I use them for nose hooking. I'll show you in a minute. 
Most of them are real small. Typically, you're looking at a number six. I think I've seen a number eight, almost. And uh, usually stop about one alt, maybe even two alt will be the biggest. But this is what you're going to be doing with it. So the rig on the left, you basically will drop shot nose hook. Um, that's how I first started fishing these styles of hooks. I started drop shotting robo worms, much like that one in the picture there, and just nose hooking them. You miss some smaller fish, but most of the time they'll take it by the head and move on off with it and you'll get them. But it gives that robo worm insane amount of action. So that's why I really did it. In the right side of the picture there, you've got your weightless wacky rig Cinco. Guys are doing that too. You will get more hang-ups and snags, especially around docks and trash and stuff like that. But um, for open water fishing, a, weight, a weightless Cinco, you don't need that weed guard. So back in the day, we used octopus hooks. And that little dude at the bottom right is, I don't know if you've watched any of my other videos, but that's my baby. So that's my Zoom Tiny Fluke with a nail weight thrown up inside and a little old number six. Uh, Sometimes a number four, depending. Most of the time it's a six. Um, thrown up in his nose to just get bit when it gets real tough. That's my baby right there. And that rig has worked wonders for me in the fall for sure. Twist lock and screw lock hooks. Most of these are going to be extra wide gap style. These are holding swim baits, frogs, things like that. Like I said, they're popular for swimming baits over and through cover. So they stay weedless, but they stay keeled. A lot of these have weights on them. Most of them have some type of, you know, real wide gap. Some of them are thinner than others. Like I said, some are weighted, some are not. And typically, these are the bigger hooks. These aren't really small. I don't know that I've seen anything smaller than a one alt, And I've seen some big ones. Like, like I said, 10 alt, big, nasty monster hook from owner it's massive for those great big swim baits guys are throwing <coughs> but this is typically how you're going to be rigging these baits are going to be on on baits you need to come through cover with that are actively swimming or skipping across the surface the one at the top is and actually what these baits are what these hooks are really good for is holding the nose of the bait tight to the hook eye um, <clears throat> they're not going to slide down. Uh, they're going to be tight up there and keep everything straight and in line like you need for coming through vegetation and stuff like that. Because the, the head of the bait's going to be beating against vegetation, the trees, whatever you're fishing. This will keep everything in line and straight so that it doesn't hang up, it doesn't come through sideways, it doesn't come back twirling. And that's where maybe having a belly weight will help that too. If it's a great old big bait with a lot of kick, it may create so much vortex that it tries to spin. Frogs are like that a lot. So bait at the top left, <clears throat> that's your um, skinny dipper again by Reaction Innovations. Great swim bait. Uh, the bait down there in the bottom left is a little favorite of mine. That's a slider grub. And it's a little trick I found out a few years ago. If you take a little one aught owner twist lock hook like that, um, stick it in that little slider grub that's a three inch bass slider grub it's a fun little top water swim bait um, to put on light line to catch <laughs> everything from six to eight inch bass all the way up to three and four pounders so i have fun with that little rig especially in small water but these hooks really excel for frogs and on the right on the top right you see the zoom horny toad and that is the actual horny toad hook from zoom it's got a longer angle to its eye down the shank, I guess. Um, the spring's a little bit bigger too on the keeper there. Hook's real, real long, real, real spread out. Um, so it's gonna have a little more flex to it. When I throw a horny toad, I throw it on a gamagatsu hook. I do not use the horny toad hooks. I just don't trust them. That's my opinion, but that's what that hook was designed for. And there on the bottom right is the ribbit, probably my favorite frog of all time as far as a buzzing frog and Stanley has developed a double take hook that goes up you can see kind of in the picture there it goes up through the hip joints as it were to give you two hooks instead of one going through their frog uh, kind of keeps him flat too kind of keeps him from you know rolling a little bit because you've got everything centered up they do make this hook with a weight as well I have not tried that hook again I have found a hook in Gamagatsu that works real well. It's a super line belly weighted hook. 
about a four alt, I think, um, with just a little bit of weight on the belly, just a one sixteenth. It's very similar to the hook you see there in the top right on the skinny dipper. Super good screw lock to it. I don't lose any rivets anymore, and it hits them home good. So, But give that double take hook a try if you think you want to try two hooks or better than one kind of techniques. Talking about trailer hooks, a lot of people forget about these. I don't because I'm a big spinner bait nut. Looking at trailer hooks are typically just a straight shank hook. Typically, they don't have nothing else on them. No frills, no nothing. They have a big old eye. And the reason for that is so they can get over the main hook of the spinner bait, buzz bait, whatever you're going to put it on. Usually, it's a little heavier gauge. Um, it's going to try to max the strength, match the strength of the spinner bait hook itself. Usually, those are a lot stronger, too. Um, it's most popular on the R-Bend spinner baits, but you can put them on whatever you want within reason. And there are tons of company options, and they're really not expensive at all. They're pretty cheap. If you're going to use a trailer hook, which I recommend using a trailer hook with any re steady retrieve wire bait, spinner bait, buzz bait, whatever, um, I'm always... I'm always going to use this method for attaching the trailer hook to my baits. Let me explain. So if you look at how <clears throat> the trailer hook is on the bait, it's free to swing. It's free to slide up the shank and down. It's free to slide back and forth. So the reason that's important is when you throw that spinner bait out there and you're looking at how it's going to come through the cover. It's going to come around a dock. It's going to careen off a rock. Whatever you're going to do, you're not always just going to have a spinner bait out in open water. You don't want that trailer hook stuck out to the side and not able to, you know, flap around and follow the main hook. It, you, <laughs> if you use the technique on the bottom where you put the plastic keeper, rubber keeper, whatever it comes with, over the eye of the trailer hook and then add it to the shank of the actual you know, wire bait itself, it's gonna be stiff, it's gonna be restricted, it's not gonna be able to follow the hook itself all the time. I don't like it. Um, I don't recommend it. Put the trailer hook on first, and then put your keeper on afterwards to leave that trailer hook free swinging. And try to run it as close up there to the barb of the main hook of the bait as you can to let that hook have as much radius of freedom as you can. Um, again, there, if you see in the picture, I like jig skirt collars. They work great instead of cutting that little tubing that comes with um, your trailer hooks themselves. I just buy one pack of jig skirt collars from Bass Pro Shops. It's like $4 for 50 of the things, and they work phenomenal. So a little trick there to save you some money and some headache buy some skirt collars. They work great. Just put them in the same little box or bag you have your trailer hooks in and be done with it. They work great. You can use a treble hook as a trailer and a feathered treble at that looks pretty awesome. But you better be in open water. <laughs> That's what I, I, I will do this for school and fish if I want to show them something different. You can't tell me the last time you were fishing for school and fish either in late fall middle of summer, winter time, even around hot water discharges, and you saw somebody throw a spinner bait and burn it on the surface. Most of it is spoon, crankbait, fluke, top water, all that. They don't see many spinner baits. If you're gonna do this technique and you're just gonna keep it in open water, you can get by with a treble hook and it'll really help with hookups. And a feather treble looks pretty sick coming out of the back of a spinner bait, I'm not gonna lie. But <laughs> Take it off and put a regular one on there before you go to the bank because you're going to hang up on your first cast for sure. Just a little tip. You can use feathered trebles on a spinnerbait, and they look pretty tight, but do it in open water. Going into treble hooks, there's really only two types of trebles. Most of these are fished on all our hard baits in open water. You're not really dragging them through veg. You can with a rattle trap but it's not optimal. Typically, there's only two kinds. Your round bin, there on the right corner, and down there in the middle, the EWG, or the uh, triple grip, as Mustad has named it. There's lots of different treble hook manufacturers. There's tons of them, and they're very, very widely available. 
prices will vary based on quality, size, materials, and probably angle. I think EWG is a little more expensive than round bins for sure. There is one little special case down there that David Fritz developed for VMC and Rapala um, called his Scorpion Hook. I don't remember. I think it was called the Sure Set Hook. He made one of the hook points on the treble hook almost like an EWG hook to try to help hook fish better. I didn't buy it. I didn't like it. I'm not going full with them. <laughs> if you find some, they don't even think they make them no more. If you find some, take a look at it. Give me your opinion on it, but I'm going to stick with the regular old treble hooks myself. So to compare these two, on the left, you have your round bend. On the right, your EWG slash triple grip. The one on the right is most widely used. The hook points are pointing straight up. Tons of different sizes from really, really tiny to great old big. And they're good for non-committed strikes. So if a fish slaps at this, odds are he's going to hang one of them points. You can at least get a hook in him and figure out what to do next. The one on the right, the EWG, it is gaining in popularity because more companies are making them. It looks cool. It doesn't hang up quite as much. And the difference is the hook points are pointing towards the eye of the bait, of the eye of the hook. And what that's going to do, and you see down there at the bottom, it's going to keep fish hooked up longer. So when you have pressure, pulling on each of these hooks, you can tell the difference. So on the left there with your round bend, when you have a line or a crankbait or whatever pulling against that split ring on that treble hook, if you have pressure on that far left hook point, it's going to naturally swing the other hook points out. That's just what it's going to do because it's going to take the weight of the pressure from the split ring pulling that one hook point up because it has hit something now. So the other ones are going to key out, which there's no other way of doing it. It's physics. So with that, you have a chance of only getting one hook point buried in a fish properly which, I mean, you take what you can get when they hit it. They ain't never going to hit it the same way twice if you're throwing a crankbait or a topwater or whatever. And we kind of just hope and pray those treble hooks have hit something hard in there and they're holding tight. On the right, the hook points are pointed in towards the eye. You can see those angles there by the yellow arrows. So while they may not get all those non-committed slaps and strikes and crazy blow-ups we get on spooks and stuff like that, once they get in there, it's real hard for the angle and the pressure of the fish to pull it off. All those hook points are turned in like a grappling hook. So if it if it gets a hold of them, odds are they're going to stay pinned unless they just work that hole way too big. And each fight of the fish with treble hooks is different based on what the fish is actually doing, how hot the fish is, has she worn a hole already in her mouth, do you have a hook good to start with, but... Those EWGs will help get a few of those fish to the boat more so than the round bends. However, you're going to miss those slap fish that the round bend might stick on a rare occasion where they just slap at it and don't even get the bait in their mouth. So pros and cons of both. I've tried both. I can't tell you that I necessarily see the major difference between the two, but I hadn't really tried it in an in-depth experiment. So it might be something you want to play with. Can't hurt though to try something new. If you stop liking it, just go back to the Old Faithful. Feathered trebles. We talked a little bit about this with that one little spinnerbait idea. A lot of people put these on their topwaters. Um, they're great for adding a little bit of realism, a little bit of action to the rear of the bait. Um, they help finish off the bait, in my opinion, if you're trying to emulate a sunfish or a shad. Uh, the issue is... It, if you put them on anything that isn't designed to have a feather treble on it, it's not going to run the same. Um, these things are going to cause drag to the rear of the bait, and that bait has to be ready to pull that down. Some baits are designed to have them, like an X-Wrap, things like that. Certain jerk baits have them. A lot of topwaters have them. But if you take a bait, like a Lucky Craft Pointer 78 or 110 or any of them, jerk bait that isn't designed to have a feathered treble and you put a feathered treble on it it is not going to swim the same which could be good or bad just know it's not going to be the same so 
experiment with that a little bit if you ever want to play with treble with uh, feather trebles. But just know if anything you're gonna do other than top water, it ain't gonna swim the same. If anything, it's gonna swim less active because you're putting drag on the rear of the hook. They're awesome on top water though. I've used them for years for that application. Okay, we're gonna go into weights. A little bit simpler, still really important. Worm weights. <clears throat> Obviously, everybody and his brother knows what the left weight is. That's the old Texas rig bullet weight. Been around for years and years and years. Typically, she's free sliding above the hook to make the Texas rig. She likes to wedge into rocks pretty good because of that bullet nose in the front. Most of them are lead. We're going to talk about a flipping weight in a second. This tungsten. They're readily available. They're super, super cheap, and there's a thousand different sizes of them. You get everything from a sixteenth all the way up to two or three ounces, and everything in between. Bullet weights are everywhere. You can find a bullet weight to do what you need to do. It may not be the prettiest thing in the world, but you can find one to get it done. Next weight there is a flipping weight. Most of these are tungsten. Some can be free slide, but most people are pegging them now. We'll talk about that some later. These were designed to use for punching heavy vegetation with a smaller diameter weight instead of lead. It's about twice the heaviness of lead in the same size package. So instead of flipping a four inch long Texas rig weight, you can flip a little one and a half inch long Texas rig weight and still have that weight you're looking for to punch through that mat. The problem with these things is they get expensive. One of these weights could be $10 and that's not even a joke, which is shocking, but most of these are printed quarter and two ounces. More often than not, guys are using from a half ounce to an ounce. When you do get around some real heavy stuff down in Florida and things like that, they will go up to about an ounce and a half, sometimes a two ounce weight. I have never bought anything heavier than a half ounce weight. I haven't had the need for it around North Carolina. One day it might happen, but they are expensive. So be ready to cry when you hang up and lose one. The screw in weight on the right is, is something I don't think a lot of people fish. I've been fishing them for several years now. Um, another common name is a Florida rig. So this is basically a bullet weight that has a spring on it and a little old straw goes through the weight to protect your line as it goes, you know, around that spring or through that spring as it were and uh, keeps the weight of your bait screwed into the soft plastic you're fishing. So this keeps it all one natural looking profile going through without having to peg it against your line, which is an interesting way of doing it. Um, if you don't line it up just right, it will get a little crazy, a little cockeyed down there, but it works pretty good. I've been using them for a while. Most are lead. I have seen a couple tungsten ones, but there's not very many manufacturers that make these. They're kind of going away. Um, I can't tell you that I have any problem with them except for what I'm going to describe here in a minute. But first, <clears throat> on the left there, everybody knows what a Texas rig looks like. The weight's just free sliding all the way up the line, all the way down to the head of the bait. On the middle there, you have your punch weight. Typically what you have there is a big old fat punching hook like we've talked about before, and some type of bobber stop above it to keep it from sliding up the line any further. One tight, compact package. On the right there, you have your Florida rig. And one thing I'll talk about with the Florida rig, AKA the screw-in weight, is you have to make sure your hook fits in your bait after your weight is screwed in. And if you look at the picture there on the right long enough, you'll understand what I mean because that little old straw and spring comes down into the head of the bait. And you have to add yourself another half inch of room when you thread that hook through that bait so the eye of the hook isn't bent up against that straw there coming out of the weight. I've learned to figure out that you go down about a one size in hook hook size to make this process work if you're going to use this. As you normally would use a four alt hook, slide down to a three and keep going down the line. But keep that in mind. There's no pegging against the line. The line's in great shape. It's not hurting anything. You're just screwing that hook, or I'm sorry, that weight down into that head of that bait and it keeps everything nice and tight. Interesting little rig. With Carolina rig weights, which are not necessarily just for that, but that's what I use them for. You have your egg sinkers. You can use a bullet weight if you want, like we just talked about, or your finesse tech weights. Most people are using an egg or a finesse tech when they're doing this type of fishing. 
The eggs are rounded off to slide over the bottom. They're pretty durable, pretty hard. They can wedge into rocks pretty easy, but they're pretty good at coming out of them. Most of these are lead. I have seen some that are tungsten. Hardly anybody buys them. And there are numerous, numerous sizes. You can get tiny, tiny egg sinkers and great old big egg sinkers. Your finesse tech weights are usually a thinner profile, cylindrical barrel weight. They're used for your lighter Carolina rigs where you don't want so much bulk. Most are lead. They're pretty readily available and most of them are a little bit smaller. I uh, don't think I've seen any, I don't think I've even seen any over two ounces. So what you're going to do with these is very similar to how everybody fishes a Carolina rig for catfish or whatever you do with it. Um, <clears throat> you can use a bead if you want. I don't use a bead. I just put a swivel and a leader to a hook to a bait. And then on my main line, I slide that egg sinker up with that finesse tech weight that I like. Tie a good knot to the swivel and you're done. Um, for bigger baits, I'm going to use that heavier weight. If I'm coming over rocks and stuff like that, I need to make sure it bounces a little bit more off the bottom and not just drags down in the bottom. I'm going to go with the barrel sinker with the, with the egg sinker. And then if there's a flat bottom, clean bottom, I want a more low profile rig, I'll go with that finesse tech weight. More often than not, I'm just going to be going with the egg sinker and let it be universal for all my Carolina rig fishing. Drop shot weights, which are becoming more popular now. Drop shotting is becoming more mainstream. First thing I ever drop shot it with was a bass casting sinker, old bell sinker there on the left that you can get anywhere at Walmart or anywhere else real cheap. You tie your line directly to the loop below the hook and bait you've already rigged up. Most all of these are cheap old lead, readily available. Walmart sells them every day for a dollar and something a pack. And there are tons of weight options with these guys. With the tungsten drop shot weights on the right there, they are specifically designed just for drop shot fishing. So, <coughs> excuse me, what they want you to do is once you've got your hook rigged up and you've got your leader tag coming down to your weight, you're going to snap your line into those little clips. And I don't trust them. So what I do is I tie me a little overhand knot and then slip the line up through the clip so it can't pull through. My luck, I'd pull a weight off as soon as I pulled up through some rocks or something. So <clears throat> what this does, this allows for an easy swap of weights. You can slide the weight up the line and down the line pretty easy. Most all of these are tungstens. They're pretty expensive and there's you know, good amount of weight options. Most of them are only up to about a half ounce. But this is what you're basically building. Once you tie a Palomar knot there to your hook, which we'll talk about later, um, and you have your leader coming down, that one on the left there, just a bass casting sinker, just tie it on however you want, whatever knot you want to use. Um, just an improved clinch knot or whatever, Palomar, whatever you want to do. The one on the right there, that's the, the pro tungsten drop shot sinker, you can see how it works there in that little diagram. You're basically passing your line through the fat part of the clip and pulling it up into the pinch point, which again, I tie a little old, tiny overhand knot and let it pinch up in there so it can't pull through, even if I get wedged in some rocks or something. So something to try. If you're a drop shot fisherman, you already know all this. Um, those, those cylindrical weights versus the ball weights for feel and does it go through rock and does it let you feel the sand better. All that jazz. I still fish an old regular bell sinker on the left. I ain't had no problem with it since. <clears throat> Other little special weights. Everybody again knows what split shot are. We all learned how to fish split shot on our corks and night crawler rigs growing up fishing ponds. You're, it's just going to be a crimp on lead weight. You can add wherever you want on your line. Um, it's good for light rigs, but if you need some real heavy stuff, I, I wouldn't necessarily go with split shot. I would figure out some other way of, of really securely adding weight to your line because it can be easily removed. It's just a, a basically a friction pinch on your line and uh, it can come off pretty easy or slide up and down pretty easy as well. But again, tons of sizes, very cheap to buy. There are thousands and thousands of little kits with split shot in them. So. Good to have though, just in case you need it for something in particular. A nail weight, I use these on my weightless soft plastics now to add just a hint of weight here and there. Um, they're pretty cheap once you get them. The guys started this by using finishing nails and somebody said, hey, we'll make those out of lead and sell them. So that's what's going on now. They're easier to cut, easier to manipulate and customize how much weight you do slide into your plastic. So I like them. I've been fishing them for a couple years in my flukes. Uh, they're readily available. They're very light. Um, 
so yeah, just think about it next time. If you got a lure in mind or a bait in mind, you fish weightless that uh, maybe you'd like to see what a little bit of weight will do to it. Nail weight's a good way to go. And that Nico rig weight there on the right is just basically a screw made of lead um, that pushes up into the nose of the bait and uh, creates that little mushroom head at the bottom for that worm or whatever bait you're using to skip around on the bottom while the hook's above him in his, in his little torso area there. Um, they're getting, they're probably going to be really expensive because they're made just for Nico rigging and uh, guys will have to have them. So they'll probably be a little more expensive, but um, you can pretty much just use a screw of the right size and caliber you want and it'll do the same thing. We've seen that rig on the left already before. That's your Nico rig. Um, <clears throat> the rig there on the top right is a rig that I personally have used um, in water that's shallower than three feet. I'm trying to think of where I was fishing. And um, yep, it was no deeper than two and a half, three feet. I actually took a really, really tiny crawl bait. That's a Strike King Bitsy Bug Jig trailer. It's very small. It's like two and a half inches long. And uh, I split shot it and basically made a teeny tiny Carolina rig for some light, uh, light tackle, like spinning rod tackle. And that was a blast. The bass love that little technique, letting that little crawfish hang up there above that lightweight. And then at the bottom, there's the nail weight stuffed into my tiny fluke again. Love, love, love that rig. If you haven't tried it, you need to. Um, we're going to dive into jig heads, and there's a bunch of them. And I'm going to try to take my time and go through each one of them and, and why they are the way they are. So the most popular one, of course, is your shaky heads. There's three different really kinds of shaky heads now, and I'm going to include Ned Rigs in this because basically it's a shaky head, but just a little different. So the ones on the right there, what I'm going to call the head keeper jigs, the ones on the bottom are the thread them on jigs, and then the ones on the right are your Ned jigs. So your head keeper jigs, these somehow have a spring or an attachment post of some sort that keep the head of the soft plastic laid right up against the head of the jig. It's typically used for your stand-up presentations rather than a flat drag. And then some have the flatter heads that help them stand up, but those can hang in the rocks easier because of their flat edges. And the rounder ones are going to lay down a little more diagonal and come through the cover a little bit better. So it's kind of a give and take there. The two on the left are spot removers. The one on the right top there is a chompers shaky head. And the one on the bottom, I believe, is an owner twist lock shaky head. Yes, screw lock shaky head. So this is what they all look like with the same exact zoom finesse worm built to them. And you can kind of see the way they were designed to stand up, to keep that hook ready to be penetrated, screw the spring into the head of the bait, push that post of the first Buckeye spot remover into the head of the bait. It keeps everything real tight, real clean, real buttoned up. But this may not be what you want to look like if you're dragging across a flat that's going to take you to the thread -mons. This was the first shaky head I ever used. It's actually the one on the bottom right down there, which is a bite me head. And I used a Strike King KVD 3X finesse worm. This is going to keep the first one to two inches of the bait up against the hook shank. So you have to understand we're not dealing with anything coming off of the ball head itself now. We're dealing with just a hook shank keeper holding the worm on. So this is typically going to be used for a little bit flatter presentations rather than stand up. Most all of these heads are round. There's going to be a couple that are flatter. But this keeper is going to tear up that plastic faster than those screw locks did. So for this, if you want it to last longer, like I've said there at the bottom, your last tech baits are going to work best. And here's one of them. So there's the jig heads down there, and you can see the angle at what the worm has to come out of those keepers to make it up to that hook, to make it as weedless as possible. It's difficult. It is. There's going to be some angle in there. It's going to look a little different than the uh, screw lock heads, but this is a Strike King 3X Elastic Finesse Worm, one of the first shaky heads I ever, ever used was this, so this worm, and that pretty much that head there on the left is the exact same thing. Um, this is going to work really well for your flatter presentations, dragging across bottom, across little gravel points, across sand flats. Uh, if you want to pull it through a dock instead of hopping it around the pilings, 
Um, the, the problem is if you put a zoom bait on there, it's going to have a hard time staying up, you know, on the shank of the, of the hook of the jig head. It's going to slide down. They're so soft. But if you use this Elastec stuff, it's stretchy as all get out. And once you get it over a keeper, it ain't moving. That's the best way to go. Plus, with Elastec, you cannot screw it onto a screw lock. It will not work. So this is the best way to go with that anyway. So, like I said, we'll go back a slide. If you're going to use Zoom, things like that, Robo Worm, you're going to use a shaky head, I recommend a screw lock style. Just for me personally, if you're going to use Elastec baits, I recommend this more style jig head with the good strong keeper on the shank of the hook. But that's just me. With your Ned rigs, and I have fallen in love with this little guy. I've been fishing it for about two years now. And let me tell you, he catches fish when nothing else will. Used to be just one style that Z-Man put out. I don't know if they bought it from the fella or what. They started pushing that... Uh, little Ned rig jig head, the finesse shrooms head, mushroom head. And now there's a bunch of them out there. If you go on tackle warehouse, there's probably 12 companies making them, if not more. This is a small little mushroom head with a fine wire hook to fish finesse wide open across flats, around docks, around cover. Some are weedless and some are not. I always buy weedless. Um, and if you're going to fish this bait, your last tech baits, stretchy baits are going to hold up longer and they're also going to float better. But this is a stand up presentation. So these are all from Z Man. And it's not because I'm sponsored by Z Man or I think they're the greatest thing in the world. Nobody else catches fish. But these things are all made of a last tech. And they're all built around Z-Man's Ned Rig head, which in my opinion is still one of the best. Until I try somebody else's and it blows me away, this is what Ned Rigs are. They're straight little finesse baits that are made out of a high floating material that get bit when you need a bite. I don't know why, but they do. Um, the baits down there at the bottom, the finesse TRD and the big TRD are the two that started it all. The hula stick came along just to have a little bit more action the hogs there next to last come out very recently a whole different profile of bait and then the little old trd crawls there in the far right we're going to talk about in a minute in depth is a game changer love that little guy but you can see how they're rigged up there on the left of this picture um, depending on what size bait is whether you get the long shanked um, trd mushroom head or the short one and that's all personal preference. I like the short ones. That's me. This little guy here, though, Z-Man has taken upon themselves to design a whole rig system for this guy. So the TRD crawls plus the new TRD bullets jig head. That's a jig head there in the middle equals amazing. This little package is only three inches long. And what they have done is they have built a jig head directly around this crawfish. So... One thing they did is they put it on a really small hook. This looks like a number one, maybe a one aught at most. It's small. What they've done is they've added <clears throat> a bullet style um, head at the front, but they've kept the eye pointed up instead of straight out the bullet. And that way it try to keeps it keeled and not spin. What they've also done is they've added a belly weight to the hook that also helps keep the crawfish always belly down and drag over rocks better. And on top of that, the belly weight itself acts like a little grip pin to keep the bait from sliding down. The whole thing works phenomenal. You see it there on the right. It's a great little small bait. Three inches long. I'm ready for smallmouth fishing in the new river. This thing's going to work great. But that's a new jig head that's out now. It's supremely custom for wrapping around a particular bait in that little TRD crawls. I'm super excited about this rig. Uh, if you fish for small fish, excuse me, for small fish at all, smallmouth, spotted bass, or rock bass, or anything, uh, I think this is going to be a game changer because of just how it looks, the size of it, the hook's small, the weights are great, and that little plastic arm's just <laughs> waving up in the water like that. Very excited to start using that one. So swimming jig heads, real simple. Um, most everybody's seen the ball, just straight jig head uh, on the left there. 
It's great all around for about everything you want to do for grubs and small swim baits. It's awesome. Most of them have a little bit lighter hook. The weights will vary everything from a 32nd ounce all the way up to an ounce. Uh, the bait keeper can be bad. Keep an eye on your bait keeper when you're picking out a ball head and keep an eye on the hook too. Make sure it doesn't bend out every time you stare at it hard. But uh, these are coming in tungsten now to keep the, the head sizes smaller and they're great for small swim baits and grubs. The middle there, the flathead, um, that is a big hammer uh, jig head that goes with the big hammer um, swim bait line. They're built completely around that jig head, and I'll show you that in a second. It's a more lifelike head with the weight pulling down. You can see the weight is more down to keep it keeled better. It's great for little old swim baits and stuff like that. It does have a little beefier hook and a better bait keeper. So most of those are, are used for a little bit stronger baits that need, you know, some heavier help keeping them from sliding down. And your darter head there on the far right, you see how far back the eye of the hook is from the very nose of that bait and that's to add a little bit of action so your pull points further back in the jig head like that and there's some some nose some wedge up there in front of it to catch water and make it move back and forth that's why it's called a darter head it's not going to come straight back it's going to veer left and right when you pump it and when you just swim it it's going to have a little bit of shimmy to it so it's going to add some action to the bait again great for grubs and small swim baits it does have a little bit lighter hook your weights are going to vary and your uh, your baits are going to try to rise a little bit due to that hook eye placement. It's not a direct pull down with the weight. You are pulling against that weight. So it may try to rise a little bit on you. So be ready for that. This is how we're going to rig these things up, guys. On the front top left there, you pair up a Bass Pro Shops starter head with a Zoom Swimming Fluke. Cut the head of that thing back a little bit. And look how perfect that lines up. So for striper, for bigger bass, stuff like that. If you really want to throw that, put it on about a quarter ounce head, throw it out and slow roll it. Great, great technique for open water fish. On the right there, that thing in the top corner has been a dominant pattern for wintertime fishing in clear water around Charlotte for the last couple of times we've been out in the winter. Um, that's a XPS tungsten jig head, a little weed guard there for helping around some docks and some rocks. And a Keytech Swing Impact Fat. That's about a 2.8 or a 3.8, depending on what you want to do. Most of the time, we're throwing a 2.8 on a 3 16 ounce head, and it is phenomenal around docks. Give it a shot next time you're around some clear water. It's a blast, especially for kids. Chuck and wine, chuck and wine. Uh, it's a great way to catch spotted bass in clear water for kids. Um, down the bottom left is your, your shad style head, your flat head there. That's a big hammer jig head with a big hammer swing and hammer swim bait. It all is packed into one good, clean hydraulic system there. Nothing ever really breaks. The, the contours work really well. That tail flaps like mad crazy, but that is what that flathead was supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like a shad style head, a flathead, and look more lifelike. There on the right, simple old ball head. Just an old ball jig head with an old Fat Albert curly tail grub from Zoom. Uh, I was fishing that for years before swim baits came along, catching fish in clear water around docks. Still a fan favorite. I still enjoy fishing it myself. Also a great alternative to a swim bait on an Alabama rig. A lot of people aren't throwing grubs. A lot of people are throwing swim baits. You want to show them something different, pick up some Fat Alberts. Be surprised. A couple other jig heads we'll go over. Tube jig heads and flick shake jigs. So tube jigs, if you're going to fish a tube, you're going to fish in open water, you're not going to flip it on a Texas rig, you can throw one of these specifically made jig heads inside the tube, and that helps the jig head hide in there and nothing but the eye and the hook point be exposed. This is going to cause that jig to spiral down, and then you pump it back up and it spirals back down. So it's kind of like a fleeing crawfish kind of deal. Typically this is... <laughs> used in open water because there's no weed guard most of the time and it's great for smallmouth and clear water. We'll show how it's rigged up here in a second. On the right, your flick shake, this is a weighted wacky rig. That's pretty much all it is. When Jackal invented this technique, they called it the flick shake. They even built a worm straight around this rig. Um, you pierce it through the middle of the bait or however you want it to fall angle wise. And you can vary your weights from, you know, like a 32nd ounce all the way up to a quarter ounce. I don't know why you'd use something that's a quarter ounce, but 
Um, most people use a 16th to an eighth. It lets it fall a little bit faster. still gives it that freedom of motion. This is how you change the rate of fall of your wacky rigs. So if you're really into wacky rig fishing, you probably already know about this technique for sure because it really helps sometimes if it's deep water fishing you're trying to wacky rig around or you want to show them a little something different. So <clears throat> on the left, that's an example of what we're going to do with a tube jig. Um, you know, get it wet and then slide it up into the tube. Once it reaches the head of the tube, you pop the eyelet out like it shows there in the bottom picture and you're done. Your hook point's exposed and your eye's exposed and that's it. You pump that thing through the column, small mouth for some odd reason cannot stand it, but you got to be careful. You need to be in open water so you don't hang up every five minutes flipping that thing around the bank of a lake. Flick shake on the right, we just talked about it. You're just going to pierce it through the head of the bait, through the middle of the bait, wherever you want in the bait, and it's going to add a little bit of weight and a weed guarded smaller octopus or some type of little hook and just change your presentation up a little bit. It's huge for clear water dock fishing. When it first came out, that's the only place I went and threw it. I was really successful with it. So if you like wacky rig fishing, give Flick Shake a try. There's plenty of them out there. A lot of different companies are making them. Find one you think looks good, matches the weight of the swacky rig hook you're already using, and go from there. So football jigs or football jig heads, um, these are kind of designed to be great for working through rock. So you can, you know, throw a jig head that normally would have a ball head or a Texas rig that might, you know, slide down into rocks and get wedged up. You can throw a football jig now and try to avoid that as much as possible. The jig heads, the hooks, the weights are all very highly variable now. Tons of companies are making these. Most of them are going to have a weed guard, but some don't. And we're going to go over kind of what they are meant for. So the one on the top left, that is just meant for throwing a Gary Yamamoto hula grub. Um, that is his football head he designed to put in his hula grubs to fish bluff walls and offshore rock structure um, when it gets cold and this fish pull out. So that is a perfectly designed head just for that hula grub. There in the middle, that is actually an offset shank hook thrown into a football jig head. Um, so it's basically like a shaky head football head jig. I know that sounds confusing, but that works really, really well with that brush hog right there. That's a baby brush hog. So if you want to flip a, a shaky head around rocks or cover, but you really like fishing a brush hog, this is one way you can do it. The one on the right there is an old favorite of mine now. I've just started fishing it this past month, and I'm falling in love with it quickly. And that's the Biffle Hardhead, and that's the Biffle Bug there with it. That's a free-swinging um, football jig head of sorts system that uh, comes through the rocks really well and is a whole new dynamic way of fishing football jig heads. And... I'm kind of falling in love with it. I'll learn it better as I go along. But right now, I'm enjoying learning um, how to fish that technique. So some other little terminal tackle we'll beat through real quick. Um, stuff you don't think about until you need it. I always have it with me. Um, bobber stops and Carolina keepers. So your bobber stops are going to be what pegs your weight, or any weight for that matter, somewhere on the line. And most of the time, this is when we're going to peg a sinker near our bait. So it all stays in one package, but you can peg stuff way up your line if you want. You can peg stuff anywhere you want once you get it on there. Um, but most of the time, this is going to be pegged um, kind of near the, the bait itself, keeping that weight tight to it. The Carolina Keepers, there's probably not a lot of people watching this video that know what they are. It's basically an alternative to using a swivel on a Carolina rig. So what you would do is you would run your weight up your line out of the way when you're rigging this thing up and you don't need a leader for building a Carolina rig when you use this thing. So run the weight on up your line and then you squeeze this thing and open the gap and thread it up on your line wherever you wanted your weight to stop and your leader to start. And once you get it there, it's done. It's there. And then you tie your hook on, however long your leader is, and you've basically got a quick Carolina rig. We're going to talk about what they look like right here. So on the left, there's your bobber stop. 
and you kind of do want to leave a little bit of gap there between the bobber and the, the weight itself so that that weight doesn't get pinched in one particular angle when flipping through cover and doesn't come through it right or you know comes out at an angle and doesn't look natural so leave a little hair of a gap there so that that weight has freedom of motion but on the right there there you see the little old carolina keeper is just straighted right up there and then you you know you got your weight and your bead smacking against it the rest of the line goes out to the hook and have a carolina rig like you would normally with a swivel just without a break um what i will say just from using these from personal experience if you're going to use anything over a half ounce so if you're throwing a Carolina rig that's, a, that's you know, a, a three-quarter ounce or an ounce, which some people do, I would use two of them <laughs> instead of just one because they will slide back down. Um, if you put all that pressure on it and all that weight on it through the air, if you cast like you're throwing a discus, um, that weight of that, that big heavy egg sinker you're using is going to hammer against that, that little Carolina keeper, and he ain't going to be able to handle it. So... Uh, use accordingly if you're going to use these and you don't want to fool with a swivel and you want to be able to adjust your leader all day long with the squeeze of the pliers um, use multiple <laughs> so I would recommend putting two on there and if that don't work cut the hook back off and put another one on there and see if that don't help but anyway they're cool little inventions they work real good for quick change of Carolina rigs um, and they, they have a place for sure so your wacky rings Man, these things have saved a lot of Senkos since they started being used. What you're doing with these guys is basically putting them over your Senko or your hard, your, your stick bait of choice, whatever. And then wacky rigging your hook through that, through that little O-ring instead of the plastic of the bait itself. Because you're tearing through Senkos really quickly if you don't do this. The wacky O tool there, the blue thing, is really critical in this, and this is especially helpful for Yamamoto Senkos that are the most full of salt and break down the quickest uh, while fishing. Uh, and we'll show that in a second. They're on the right there. Talked about skirt collars earlier. This is a way you can make your own skirts um, or add skirts or whatever you want to do. But to me, it's also a great trailer hook keeper for spinner baits. So here you go with your wacky rings. Um, Put them in the middle of the bait, put them in the front of the bait, whatever you want to do, wherever you're going to put your hook, put it on there. What you do is you slide your worm into the knitting needle there, into the little blue tube. It's hollow. And once it's in there, you just roll one of your O-rings off your keeper screw back there, up the barrel, and out onto the Senko, and you're done. It's really easy. You can do it with pliers. It's a pain. It's way easier to do it with this little wacky O-ring tool. And then you see on the picture on the far right, the person has used two of them. So maybe they are not comfortable with just one. <laughs> they wanted to use two. So what they've done is they've used two of them and crisscrossed them. So they're super, super tough. And that Senko ain't going nowhere. So that's an interesting way of doing it too. Talking about the skirt collars. If you want to make a skirt up in the field, you can. If you keep your, if you're that much into jigs and spinner baits, and you want to be able to customize a skirt once you get to the lake and you see the water, or you see what the fish are doing with the skirts you're throwing now, you can take this little ten dollar tool at the top right, or I mean, sorry, the top left here, and build your own skirt. So you put the skirt collar over the pointy part, and you can see it there on the right. The, uh, the diagram they're teaching you how to do it. You pull the tabs of the skirt material down into the knitting needle. Um, you cut off the ends of the tabs and you roll the skirt collar off and that's it. You've developed a quick, tiny little process of making a jig skirt. Um, there are guys that do this, the real big time jig fishermen, they will build a skirt on the boat when they're out on the lake. If they lose a jig, if it's not the quite color they want, whatever, uh, you can do this on the boat in five minutes. Very simple. What we used to have to do before this little thing came along is down there on the bottom left, they had these pliers that were reverse tension. So when you squeezed them, you know, they opened and you have to put the little skirt collar there in between his teeth and open it up. And hopefully you could slide the threads of the, of the, <laughs> the skirt material itself through there before it popped off. So uh, this new method here on the right is way, way better. Um, so yeah, if you want to build skirts on the water, you can do it. You just got to have the right tools and the right skirt material with you and you can make any skirt you want right there in five minutes. So we're going to talk about a couple knots you need to know and then I'm going to settle up with you and let you go to bed. So 
the fisherman's knot or the improved clinch knot is probably the most basic one we all know. I can do it with my eyes closed now. I've developed a way to do it with my hands and using my teeth at the same time to hold this tag versus that tag versus that direction. So I can tie this thing in about seven seconds at this point in time. You're going to go through your main eye of your hook, wrap back around with the tag around the main shaft of the hook. I do it four times. Five is fine, <laughs> I suppose. I do it four times, and then you're going to go away from your body. And in this picture, that would be up right there in number three. So as long as you go away from you first, through the loop you created by doing your wraps between the eye of the hook and the wraps. When you go up through that loop, you just created another one with your hand and you're going to come back through that one. That's step three, or I'm sorry, step four. Once you do that, all of it's going to start tighten to cinch or starting to kind of bite down on itself. You're going to want to wet your wraps and you're going to want to wet down there by the eye where that line is sliding as you pull the tag. And when you do that, you pull the tag and you pull the main and they're both going to crimp together and cinch up real tight. Just be careful to make sure it's wet when you do your final cinch there at step four and five. But that is the fisherman's knot or the improved clinch knot. This is the same knot with one step added. They call it the trialing knot. I call it the double improved clinch. So what you have done is in step one, you duplicate it. Instead of going through the eye of the hook and immediately coming up to wrap four times, you're going to go back through the eye of the hook the same direction again. So through the loop of the hook, come all the way back around and do it again the same direction. And what that does is it creates a loop of line right there on the eye of the hook, ready to cinch down onto it. Then you go back up and do your barrel rolls, just like a clinch. But when you go to go back through the loop near the eye of the hook you've created by making your barrel rolls, you also go through that first extra loop that's there as well, the same time. When you do that, it will not slip. And that's why this is one of the most popular knots other than the Palomar for fish and braided line. So what it does is it creates that loop there that has to bite down on the eye of the hook and it can't slip because anytime it pulls, it's squeezing harder against the eye of the hook. It's not cinching down to the eye of the hook with barrel roll turns. It's squeezing against the eye of the hook with that loop around itself. So once you tie it, you kind of get it. You're like, oh yeah, I just got to go through another loop. Yep, just got to go through another loop. And that makes it bite itself down on the eye of the hook and it cannot slip. Practice with that one a little bit. It's easy once you get it down. This is one of the easiest knots to tie and probably the most strongest knot we use. This is a Palomar knot. And what they tell you to do is double the line and throw it through the eye. That's not what you want to do. Especially if you have a really small eye drop shot hook and you can't do that with eight pound fluorocarbon or 10 pound fluorocarbon. So what you would do is take the tag of your line there and go through the eye and pull out a little bit, give you enough room to work, turn that line around and go back through the eye like you're going to take it back out, but not go all the way. And what that does is that lets you have a double of line. Then you take that double of line and you just tie an overhand knot. Once you've got your overhand knot, you thread your lure, your hook, your bait, whatever it is, you're through the loop of that overhand knot, like you see from step four to step five there. But before you sense this knot tight, as you can see in step five there, they're taking the loop, you know, around that hook. You know, that hook's falling down into that loop after the overhand knot has been tied from step four to step five. You want to pull all that up to the top of the hook before you cinch. Now, they didn't tell you that. You really want to do that because if you don't, it can bite and 
it can bite down on the bottom of the eye of the hook there where the hook shank meets the eye and the knot will not perform right. So when you go from step four in this picture to step five and you've got the bait, the hook, whatever it is, already through that big loop, pull all that mess to the, grab it and pull all of it up above the hook before you cinch. It's just little stuff like that I figured out over the years that make it a lot easier. Wet everything down when you make your cinch. The way you'll know if you've tied it correctly is if when you pull everything tight, your tag should be directly parallel to your main beam line. It'll be sticking straight back up at it, and that's how you'll know you've tied it right. But this knot is super quick to tie, super easy to tie. Once you learn it, it's very, very simple. It is very, very strong, and it's probably the only one you need most of the time. The last knot I'm going to talk about is the double uni knot, the uni to uni knot, however you want to call it. This is how you attach two lines together, whether it be fluorocarbon to braid, braid to mono, mono to mono, mono to fluorocarbon, whatever you're going to do. You're going to take the two ends of the material and face each other. So the tag of your rod, whatever that is, if that's braid, normally that's what it is. The main line coming out of your reel is braid. And then the leader would be, let's say, 12-pound fluorocarbon. You're going to face them against each other, the two ends, and you're going to let them go past each other and pull them and lay them side by side on top of each other. You have to form a little loop, as you see in number one there. So you've come back and formed a loop, and then you're going to wrap over the other line and around the line you're using in a barrel. So it's almost like snelling, if you know how to do a snell knot. It's very similar to that. What you're doing is you're creating some barrels of loops to butt up against the other line when you do the same thing with it. You're creating a sliding noose of four or five or six, however many loops you make. I recommend eight to nine if you can help it. But once you've tied this knot, get on get on YouTube a little bit and watch some guys tie it or get some line and do it yourself. When we were at the class in person, I taught people how to do it in person. But <clears throat> once you do it, you realize how easy it is. It's not that difficult. It's basically making two uni knots that are opposed to each other and cinching them together. You trim off the tags and now you've got a, a knot that's really going to get tighter the more it's pulled on itself. So uni to uni knot, do a little bit of research on it. It's my favorite one for tying leader to main, something else to something else. If you have to tie two different lines together, uni to uni knot's the best one to use. And that's it guys. I tried to make it quicker tonight. A lot of stuff about hooks, a lot of stuff about sinkers and jig heads, a little bit of stuff about some knots you might want to try. Appreciate everybody for tuning in. If you want to follow us, we're on Facebook at Brostaff Bass Class. My name is Dave Ferguson. Hunt me down. I'm on it all the time. If you're watching this video, it is obviously posted to the Ferg Fish account. All my classes are on there. This is volume six, so there's five more on there. Help yourself to check those out. Any questions, any love, any comments, please don't hesitate. I love doing this. And I'm going to keep it up. I appreciate you watching. Thank you all very much.